Hello everyone, uh, this is Jeff from Mississippi in the Civil War. I hope everyone is enjoying a wonderful Memorial Day and uh, remembering the sacrifices of our, our soldiers who have served in so many conflicts uh, over the many years that our, our great country has, uh, has been around. And today, uh, this is a special episode. This is the first time that I have allowed a um, viewer to choose the topic of the episode. And uh, I had some really great ideas. It was a contest. I uh, let everyone submit ideas. I put the ideas in a hat and I drew one out. Uh, the winner was Frankie Tatum, who wanted an episode on the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, which I thought was a great idea. Uh, amazing battle, one of uh, Forrest's uh, signature vi victories, one of the, I think, one of the most complete uh, uh, victories of the war. And um, I had to do this on a rather truncated timeline. I got the idea to do this whole contest in rather short notice. So I had to put this together uh, in just a matter of a few days. So please excuse the, the very general nature of this presentation. It's not uh, in a huge amount of depth. I just simply didn't have the time. This is, this is what I had, had, <laughs> had time to put together and I, I hope you like it. And I've already decided since it went over so well and I had so many great ideas for episodes, I'm going to do this contest again uh, on uh, July 4th. And uh, so stay tuned. In a, in a week or two, I'm going to post another episode where you can, again, give me your ideas uh, for an episode. And this time I'll have a little more re lead time so I can really uh, go into some depth, hopefully, on, uh, on the, the winning topic. But I plan on having that, uh, that second contest um, uh, episode air uh, on the July 4th weekend. And that would give me plenty of time to get it to, to get it ready. But let's get back to today's episode. Uh, as I said, uh, the winner was Frankie Tatum. He chose the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads. And so uh, this is going to be our episode for today. And to begin with, after Sherman's Meridian campaign in February 1864, where he literally marched across uh, the width of the state from Vicksburg to Meridian, uh, the Confederate forces in Mississippi were significantly depleted uh, by sending two infantry divisions and a large part of the cavalry in the state of Mississippi as reinforcements to the Army of Tennessee, commanded by General Joseph E. Johnston, for the, who was uh, preparing his defense of the city of Atlanta. This left uh, the uh, defense of the state of Mississippi in the capable hands of Major General Stephen D. Lee, uh, who had been put in command of the Department of Alabama, Mississippi, and East Louisiana, and West Tennessee. Uh, the main force that Lee had left uh, to protect this area after all of these reinforcements were sent to Johnston was the cavalry of Major General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Now, Forrest was one of the true military geniuses produced by the Civil War. He started off a private uh, during the course of the of the conflict. He rose to the rank of lieutenant general, uh, the only man on either side, as far as I'm aware, uh, to rise so far. And uh, what makes this really uh, remarkable is that Forrest had no prior military experience. Uh, he was born in Tennessee on uh, July 13, 1821. In 1834, his uh, family moved to Marshall County, Mississippi. So, of course, the state of Mississippi does have uh, strong ties to uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, soon after arriving, Forrest's father died, uh, leaving uh, young Nathan Bedford, uh, the man of the family, who had to help support his widowed mother and his younger siblings on the family farm. In 1845, he married uh, Mary Ann Montgomery and settled in Hernando, Mississippi, about uh, 20 miles south of Memphis. Uh, Forrest built his farm into a very successful operation, and uh, he, uh, in 1851, he moved to Memphis, where he dealt in cotton, land, livestock, and slaves, as he was a uh, well-known uh, slave dealer. And by the time the war started, uh, he had turned his investment uh, over so many times, he was a millionaire. And uh, as it would prove during the war, Forrest was a truly brilliant cavalryman. He had a instinct for terrain and how to use it. He knew how to deploy his men for maximum effectiveness. He was also a very aggressive man 
uh, who attacked his enemy with a fury, and once he attacked, he never let up until they were routed or dead. Uh, Forrest led by example, and he was wounded a number of times in combat as a result. He was always in the thickest of the fight. It is said that during the war, he had 29 horses shot out from under him, and he killed 30 men. Uh, Forrest demanded of the men that served under him that same kind of devotion, and uh, he had interesting ways of motivating them. Uh, for example, in one fight uh, near West Point, Mississippi, uh, Forrest caught one of his men fleeing the battle. Uh, Forrest jumped down off his horse, grabbed the man, beat him with a stick, and then pushed him back toward the fighting and shouted at him, Now, God damn you, go back to the front and fight. You might as well be killed there as here, for if you ever run a gateway again, you will not get off so easy. So, yeah, Forrest, uh, Forrest really had a way of motivating his men uh, for good or ill. But that was the kind of man that, uh, that uh, the war needed at this point. He was a hard charger, and he got the most out of his men, and he knew how to motivate them. So in the spring of 1864, Union Major General William T. Sherman was planning a campaign to capture Atlanta. Now he knew if he was going to succeed in this endeavor, he couldn't have Forrest loose raiding his supply lines. And that, because he needed that stuff, he needed those that rail line to keep his uh, army fed and equipped while he was marching through Georgia. And all it would take is Forrest uh, making a raid through uh, through uh, his rear areas to just uh, lay havoc to his supply lines. And Sherman was very wary, uh, very wise to be wary of Forrest. The rebel general basically used his cavalry as mounted infantry. His men would ride to the scene of the action, then dismount and basically fight on foot. And his men were experts at wrecking railroads. And if given the chance, uh, they were going to devastate uh, Sherman's supply lines. So to deal with Forrest, Sherman gave command of all the Union cavalry at Memphis, Tennessee to Brigadier General Samuel D. Sturgis. And he ordered him to, quote, move out and attack Forrest wherever he may be. And if Forrest could be kept busy by Sturgis, Sherman's supply lines uh, would be secure. So on June 1st, 1864, Sturgis left Memphis and moved south into Mississippi to find and defeat Forrest. To accomplish this mission, he had a force of 3,300 cavalry, 5,000 infantry, and about 16 pieces of artillery. So it was a formidable force, particularly given what uh, the, uh, Stephen D. Lee's Confederates had left in Mississippi. So the Union force entered Mississippi uh, just in time. For the same day they left Memphis, Forrest began riding towards Tennessee to attack Sherman's supply lines, just as, as the Union general had feared. But when uh, Confederate authorities learned of the Union advance into Mississippi, Forrest was recalled, and his 3,500 men were brought back to Mississippi and told to attack the enemy. So, on learning of the uh, enemy's whereabouts, Forrest planned to attack the Federals south of Tishomingo Creek uh, at a little place called Bryce's Crossroads. Even though his command was only about half the size of the Union force, Forrest believed that he could defeat them. <coughs> Excuse me. And Forrest explained the tactics that he hoped to use uh, to defeat this uh, uh, numerally uh, superior arm, uh, enemy. And he said, I know they greatly outnumber the troops, but the road along which they march is narrow and muddy. They will make slow progress. The country is densely wooded and the undergrowth so heavy that when we strike them, they will not know how few men we have. Their cavalry will move out ahead of the infantry and should reach the crossroads three hours in advance. We can whip their cavalry in that time. As soon as the fight opens, they will send back to have their infantry hurried up. It's going to be hot as hell, and coming on the run for five or six miles over such roads, their infantry will be so tired out that we will ride right over them. I want everything to move as fast as possible. So, on June 10th, Forest troopers made contact with the Union forces uh, at Bryce's Crossroads. In 
And just as, as Forrest uh, had, uh, had planned, uh, after getting up a good portion of his force, he had attacked uh, the Confederates before, or attacked the Federals before noon. And of the units involved in the action that day, there were only uh, two regiments of Mississippians uh, engaged. You had uh, the 8th Mississippi Cavalry, uh, commanded by Colonel William Duff, and uh, the, uh, and the 18th Mississippi uh, Cavalry Battalion. These were in uh, the brigade of Colonel Edmund Rucker. So the 8th and the 18th uh, met uh, part of Union General uh, Benjamin Grierson's cavalry on the baldwin Pontotoc Road, about a mile to the east of Bryce's Crossroads. Uh, the 8th was deployed south of the road near the center of the Confederate line, and in hard fighting, uh, the Federals were uh, slowly forced back toward the crossroads. But uh, the 8th Mississippi suffered pretty heavy casualties in the process. And one of the casualties in the 8th Mississippi was uh, Sergeant Bird C. Carradine. And I love this picture of him. Uh, that's a very distinctive uh, um, Sergeant Chevrons he's got on his, uh, his uniform. I've never seen another quite like it. But he was uh, severely wounded in the arm uh, in, the, in the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads. In fact, the, the casualty report here is from his service record. Now, positioned on the right flank of the 8th were their fellow Mississippians in the 18th Mississippi Cavalry Battalion, which was commanded by Colonel A.H. Chalmers, also part of Rutgers Brigade. Um, one of the soldiers in this regiment was a young first lieutenant named James Dinkins of Company C. And this is a picture of him. This was taken uh, just before the war when he was a cadet in a military academy in North Carolina. And he, he wrote a... Uh, a number of articles uh, for Confederate Veteran Magazine, and he wrote one about Bryce's Crossroads. And one thing he mentioned was the effect that the weather conditions were going to have uh, on the day of the battle. And he, he said in one of his, uh, his articles, uh, June 10th, 1864, the sun rose clear and bright. The heat was terrific, and the steam from the rain-soaked earth was almost unbearable for men or horses. So this was just as Forrest had planned. He knew the uh, Union Cavalry was going to make initial contact with his men, that they were going to call back for the uh, Federal Infantry to come up, and having to come up at a run uh, on, in that kind of heat was definitely going to take a toll on their fighting capabilities by the time they got to the front. So by 1.30 p.m., uh, the Union Cavalry that Forrest had been engaging was nearly out of ammunition, and their line was on the verge of collapse. At this point, the Union infantry began to arrive on the battlefield, uh, and after a, uh, and as, he, as Forrest predicted, a long, exhausting forced march in the Mississippi heat. Now, fighting through the dense underbrush, Forrest brought heavy pressure against the Union flanks, and about 5 p.m., the Federal line gave way, and a panicked retreat began. Uh, Lieutenant uh, uh, Dinkins described this retreat uh, in great detail, and he said, By this time, the entire Federal force was in the utmost confusion. The road blocked with overturned artillery, dead men, and dead horses. The survivors became panic-stricken and ran over each other. The Grand Army was in a disgraceful rout. The only bridge standing over the swollen stream had been blocked with guns and wagons overturned and their safety depended on putting the creek between them and Forrest cavalry. Unable to cross on the bridge, they plunged into the water and many were drowned. There had never been so much confusion. The enemy emerging from the water on the west bank in an open field were mowed down by the Confederate artillery, which consisted then of 14 guns. The wagons and cannon on the bridge had to be pushed into the stream before the Confederates could cross in pursuit. What uh, then had been when that had been accomplished, we pushed across in the effort to overhaul them, but the Federals scattered through the woods and fields, which made it too extended to check them. So uh, Forrest, who, who loved to keep the pressure on, uh, pursued the Federals until dark. He then gave his men a brief rest and then continued the pursuit at 1 a.m. the next morning. Because uh, <clears throat> as Forrest liked to say, um, 
his philosophy was get them skeered and then keep the skeer on them. So uh, the rebel general uh, used this philosophy to its uh, full effect after the Battle of Price's Crossroads. And he, in effect, uh, chased the Yankees almost all the way back to Memphis, capturing hundreds of prisoners and piles of equipment and supplies that the Confederacy could put to very good use. Now, among the federal units that checked the uh, Confederate advance uh, uh, after, the, uh, after the route, uh, there were among the uh, Union forces at Bryce's Crossroads a number of African-American units. Uh, the 55th and 59th uh, United States Colored Infantry Regiments and Battery F of the 2nd United States Colored Artillery. And these units fought valiantly uh, to hold open a retreat route for Sturgis's retreating men. And in doing so, uh, the African uh, Brigade suffered very heavy losses, about 110 men killed, 134 wounded, and 168 missing. And uh, there's a great statue at Corinth in the contraband camp there of a soldier of the 55th United States Colored Infantry, one of the infantry regiments fighting to keep that, uh, that retreat route open. And uh, it, it's uh, on display. They've got a number of really interesting statues concerning the, the contraband camp that are well worth your while if you've never been there. And one family uh, that lived near Bryce's Crossroads found themselves uh, caught up in the fighting that, that raged around their home. Presbyterian minister Samuel A. Agnew later wrote about what his family experienced during the battle. And he said, while the fighting was going on at the crossroads, Yankees were on the place all the time. When it was evident that that there would be a fight here, a Yankee told mother that she had better leave the house as the, as the Rebs were a going to shell it. When the fight commenced, mother and the rest of them closed the doors and the window blinds and lay flat on the floor in Margaret's room and remained safely until our men drove them away. The yard was a battleground. The Southerners on the south side and the Yankees next to the crib. I think he means a corn crib. Uh, the Yankees made a breastwork on the, of the fence between the yard and the crib lot. So he literally, their, their front yard became a literal battleground. And then four days after the battle, uh, Agnew went down to Bryce's Crossroads and described what he saw there. And he said, with Holland road on over to Bryce's, see the marks of the battle, but not so apparent as I had supposed. His house and yard are public property now. Sick men occupy the rooms. Some poor fellows are mortally wounded. I felt sorry when I looked on the poor fellows, dying so far from their dear ones at home. They are lying on pallets. The church seems to be occupied by sick prisoners. The principal surgeon was operating on a Yankee while I was there. He was lying on a table, insensible, being under the influence of chloroform. <coughs> his right foot had been amputated and his left hand half taken out. <coughs> And this picture is one I found in a newspaper in the 1950s, and they were having a reenactment of the battle. And it was noted that this cabin was there during the time of the battle and had been used as a hospital uh, during the fighting. But uh, Forrest won a great victory at Bryce's Crossroads at the cost of 492 casualties. Uh, the federal loss was 223 killed, 394 wounded, and 1,623 captured. Uh, the Confederate uh, general also reported uh, that he captured 161 mules, 23 horses, 176 wagons, 16 ambulances, and hundreds of sets of uh, harness. He also uh, captured 16 cannon and 28 limbers, 15 caissons, hundreds of rounds of artillery ammunition, 1,500 stands of small arms, and 300,000 rounds of small arms ammunition. So it was quite a haul that uh, Forrest captured at Bryce's Crossroads. Now of the two Mississippi units engaged, uh, the 8th Mississippi Cavalry and the 18th Cavalry Battalion, uh, both units had suffered very heavy uh, casualties in the fighting. The 8th had 8 men killed and 48 wounded. The 18th had 7 men killed and 44 wounded. So very similar casualties in the two Mississippi regiments that were fighting literally side to, by side. 
And uh, to close this out, I thought I would uh, just touch briefly on one uh, Mississippian who died at the Battle of Crisis Crossroads. And uh, this Mississippian uh, was James C. Jimmy Jordan, who was from Tishomingo County, but he actually joined up uh, with an a uh, Alabama outfit, uh, Moreland's Alabama, Alabama Cavalry Battalion. Uh, he enlisted in uh, Moreland's in November of 1863, along with his older brother, John, and uh, James was mortally wounded at the, the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads. He was taken to the uh, Phillips family home where he died. And uh, after his death, uh, the family buried him on their property. And at some point, two cedar trees were planted near, uh, near his burial place to mark the grave. And the cool thing is those cedar trees are still there. And uh, the, uh, just a few years ago, uh, a, a nice little memorial plaque was put up as well. It's a beautiful little spot. But uh, uh, and in, in addition to, uh, to his grave, uh, Private Jordan's, uh, and he's buried in Jericho, uh, Union County, Mississippi, uh, at what is known as the White House Ridge Confederate Graves, because there are actually two other uh, graves not, uh, not too far off of men that died at the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads. Uh, the, the grave of Private J.H. Henry of Rice's Tennessee Battery and that of Private A.J. Smith of the 11th uh, Alabama Cavalry. And it is nice to see that these graves are remembered and they are being taken care of because uh, I think that's uh, the important thing that uh, we need to, to remember uh, on this Memorial Day, the sacrifices that uh, uh, our ancestors have made uh, in battles going back to the Revolutionary War and up to modern times. And uh, I hope you, you enjoyed this, this brief little talk on the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads. It was not in depth by any means. It was just a short little overview, but I hope you enjoyed it. And please, uh, if you're uh, interested in, in ha perhaps having one of your own ideas turned into an episode, stay tuned. In the next week or so, I am going to post another video where you can uh, offer your ideas uh, for an episode. Again, I'll put them in the hat and the winner will get their episode shown uh, on the, uh, J the July 4th weekend. And uh, please, uh, if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you liked this video, please give it a like and a thumbs up because it really does help me to gauge interest in, in doing more of these types of videos. But uh, I hope you have a, a great Memorial Day, and uh, I'll be seeing you again very soon. Thank you.